Welcome back to those of you uh, watching us. Keith Tebow from FRC Media, again, with our continuing coverage of doing some interviews to get us all through this COVID-19 pandemic. You know, many of us have been dealing with a lot of anxiety and a lot of fears um, around being isolated, being at home, um, also not being able to socialize. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about what maybe some of these anxieties mean and how we can cope with them. I'm pleased to be joined right now by Dr. George Armesto. Dr. Armesto is a clinical psychologist with a practice in Providence, Rhode Island, but he's also the consulting psychologist at Bristol Community College. Dr. Armesto, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Keith. Well, I'm glad to be here. Let me just get right down to it. You know, uh, we all deal with stress and anxieties in different ways, but when it comes to dealing with this pandemic, it seems like a lot happened in a short period of time. Uh, people were getting infected. Uh, people were, were losing their jobs, all within a matter of days in, in terms of some instances. Um, how difficult is it, and, and what is your experience with people dealing with a lot of this, these anxieties, a lot of this stress happening all at one time? Uh, so I think, Keith, we, we don't need to go very far. If you just really take one moment, uh, just a couple of breaths, just for yourself, and for myself, and just check in about the amount of stress that you're experiencing, that we're all experiencing. And, and, and it's really not about comparing uh, stress or suffering, but it's really this awareness that we, these are unprecedented times and, and we're all feeling the impact of it in different ways and aware of members of our families and our communities are not only physically sick, but they're experiencing the loss of a job, the suffering that comes from that, worrying about being able to take care of their families, having a roof, uh, being able to pay rent. So all of that has come in at once. One of these stressors is enough to throw us off balance. All of these stressors, the ability to not be connected in ways that we normally are with others, with people we love, uh, really is unprecedented in there and it's reflected in how people are experiences increased anxiety and depression you know is there any correlation in terms of how people have have been reacting and the reason why i ask that is one thing that comes to mind is that when a lot of this started um people were going to the store and were hoarding um toilet paper is is the big one but even today you go to the store there's not as many meat um, in, in the meat aisle, some of the dairy products aren't there. Frozen foods are being uh, are being um, you know gathered up um, in multiple numbers. Um, is that sort of a reaction, sort of like a uh, um, a mechanism where where people are sorting to try to 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 um, get ready for something that may or may not happen? Well, I think it's a very human response. It's a survival response. Right, uh, stress activates the, our reptilian brains, the part of our of, of our of our makeup that is uh, in charge of keeping our survival. And this level of stress activates that. So we either we either freeze, we either fight, or we flight. And so so what often we do in situations like this is we gather resources because of the fear that they're not going to be around and our life is going to depend on it. Now, they might take some, in a way, funny ways, like why did we run out of toilet paper, right? But, but it really speaks to that human uh, fear response and, and survival response. You know, one of the things that I, I found interesting, we talked about this at the beginning, is that, you know, so many factors happening at once to many people. It's not just a specific tragedy or specific stressor that some of us are dealing with. There are literally thousands, millions of people across the country that are dealing with these stressors. And one of the things that I think has impacted, in my opinion, a lot of people more than others, is the fact that we are sort of prisoners in our own home. We like to socialize. We like to get out. We like to be able to uh, talk with other people and interact with other people in social situations. Um, what does socialization or the lack of, of socialization, how does that, how can that impact people in a, in a general sense? Well, again, I'm going to go back to that survival. Our, 
Our need for touch, our survival depends on our capacity to touch and to socialize. We are, that's, that's the mammalian caregiving system. We are wired to have that need and our survival depends. As infants, we depend on our primary caretakers for our survival, not only for food, but for touch. We know that when infants uh, are not touched, they fail to, uh, they, they thrive, uh, they, they have failure to thrive. And um, there have been studies, especially during the war many years ago, where they actually died. I mean, we, we need that connection. And so not being able to have that connection that we're used to is particularly challenging and it does increase our, our stress response. And so even though we have many other ways to connect, internet, it, it's not the same. It's not the same, it's disruptive of our routines. We have our habits and this disrupt, disrupts our habits. And it also, one of the things that happen is connecting through the internet might be good for one or two meetings, but it's not necessarily ideal for five hours. It's much more tiring. We're getting exposed to blue light that disrupts our circadian, uh, circadian rhythms. It disrupts our sleep. So our need to connect is such that we're gonna go at great lengths to do this because again, our survival depends on it. But what some of the ways that we're doing it by necessity uh, also creates a whole host of other problems. You know, throughout uh, this entire process with people being at home and not being able to take part in some of the socializations they're used to going to a ball game or going to the theater, going going to a movie theater, um, going to a restaurant, uh, we tend to, to be in front of our, you just mentioned, in front of our screens a lot more than we're used to. And a lot of that has to do with people's thirst for information. They're uh, watching a lot of news about uh, COVID-19 and the reporting of that. Um, I, I have to ask, th those external um, inputs, if you will, watching news incessantly, uh, maybe being consumed by what they're hearing, either be it on uh, cable news, their local news, hearing from the president, hearing from other people, can mm -hmm. that be um, an overload that can can just add to everything else that, that people are dealing with? Uh, just you asking that question and talking about it and the different layers <laughs> to the question, makes me nervous it, it raises my anxiety just really taking taking a moment to notice that and yes we as it is without a pandemic we are too overloaded with news and information it's constantly being bombarded it's those little announcements on your phone uh with a with a with a tone to it that actually uh releases hormones in our body like oh there we go i have to check that and so particularly now where also the news in general are negative, but now they're very negative, how much do you really need to be informed? So there is a balance between being informed so you can make wise decisions for yourself and your loved ones, and then what is too much information. And so one of the recommendations that most people, psychologists uh, would, would offer is, can you cut down on your uh, amount of news? Perhaps do it in the morning. Watch a news media that 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 you feel you can trust and it speaks to you, and then maybe once you know in the afternoon, and then stop there. The constantly watching the news and hearing negative things all day long, it's not going to make you safer. It's not going to add uh, more joy to your life in moments of distress. It's just going to compound the amount of anxiety and stress that you're experiencing. And one of the things that still is an unknown on is when this will end, right? When are we going to get back to normal um, as, as a society? And, and I think there's, there's going to be some time where um, there's going to be a long period of time where, you know, people may be distrustful of trying to get back into their social routines. Um, the longer that, that this lingers on, doctor, um, how how much of that just piles on and and with the, the uncertainty of what will happen in it you know in the near future um does it get easier as people start to trust themselves and trust society to get back out to where we were you know prior to this pandemic you know it's a great question I, i'm not so sure i don't know that if we're gonna go back to the same place 
Um, there might be a new normal, and I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't have a crystal ball. I do know that it's going to take time because one of the things is that our brains process information much more quickly than our bodies do, but our bodies hold the trauma that we're that we're experiencing. So you know the body really keeps the score, and it takes a lot longer for the body to process trauma and to get back to uh, a more uh, homogeneous state than our thoughts or our feelings might uh, lead us to believe. So I believe that it will take a long time. This is a tr this is trauma. We're all experiencing trauma, pretty severe trauma at very different levels. And the other thing that we're experiencing as individuals as and as a society is a lot of grief. And that often we're not aware of that. We're aware of the anxiety. We might be aware of sadness, but we're not aware of the grief. And, and grief is hard on the body and it changes us. And mm -hmm. so how do we work with grief because there's been a lot of losses. For some of us, we have lost family members that have died in hospitals and we can't be next to them. I can't imagine anything worse than that. For some of us have been the loss of dreams, perhaps people who were planning their wedding and they had planned it for two years and they had to cancel it, or many other losses. The loss of having a routine of connecting or seeing your children, if they're adult children, they don't live with you. All these are losses that we are experiencing every day, all of us. And that's going to take a long time to metabolize. As we as we wrap up here, uh, Dr. Armesto, um, how can people, you mentioned the very first answer to my first question was people just, just breathing, taking a breath, um, mm -hmm. taking the opportunity just to, to sort of just, you know, absorb things and just take a step back. What are some of the other coping methods methods that people can undertake? So there, there's different things you can do. So the first one is to really stop, even if it's for a moment. Take a moment to stop and take three in, uh, in breaths and then three slow out breaths. And while you're doing that, notice sensations in your body. Notice any feelings that may be arising or any thoughts. And there's nothing for you to do simply to be aware of them. Mm. And then coming back and 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 so it, it takes a small break, but but that's that's one mindfulness exercise, and there are many of them, and, and I'm happy to to offer more at, a, at another uh, time. But behaviorally, do things, go back to basics, do things that bring joy to your life in this moment. And that might be difficult to sometimes even imagine, but even small things, enjoying a cup of tea, taking a break and enjoying a cup of tea while you're staring at the window and looking at the, at the birds, um, taking a warm bath, perhaps doing some yoga at home, if that's something that speaks to you or working out at home just going back to basics and especially things that disconnect you from electronics because mm. that's we 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 are behind we are behind in front of screens all the time and so if you can disconnect from electronics will be very helpful and the other important behavioral thing is there's a lot of people reporting sleeping problems as a result of um the stress but also the blue light that we are getting from the screens and being in front of a screen all day. So if you can shut off the screens at least a couple of hours before going to bed and engage in reading or playing board games or things that don't involve being in front of a computer or any electronic device like your phone, that can be very helpful in starting to you know, settle the system and calm the nervous system. Dr. Armesto, how can uh, people find out more about your work? Well, you can visit my website, it's uh, goslowly.com. Um, there's some resources there. If you have any questions, please email me. The, my contact information is there. Uh, and I'll be happy to, to help uh, in any way I can. And uh, for the Bristol community, I'm part of the counseling, uh, Pr Bristol Community College. Uh, you can reach me uh, there through the counseling services. And I'm happy to offer any support to, to that community as well. 
Dr. George Armesto, thank you for joining us today. This has uh, been helpful and, and uh, maybe we'll connect again very soon. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for having me and have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. I want to thank you all for watching. Again, uh, continue to follow us on our website, frmedia.org. You'll get the latest information about things that are happening around COVID-19, as well as other news and information of importance to the city of Fall River, as well as check out our Channel 95 program guide, where you can watch on our cable channel in Fall River, as well as see some of our programs online. So again, I invite you to uh, check us out at frmedia.org. I'm Keith Tebow. Thank you for joining me again today, and we'll talk again soon.